I have one more example for you on evaluating double integrals over rectangles. In this example, we're looking at the integral from 1 to 2 of the integral from 0 to pi of y sine xy dy dx. So our inner integral is with respect to y, our outer integral is with respect to x. Now, I know what you're thinking. Zach, didn't we just do something like this in the last video? Can't we do exactly the same thing here? Well, yeah, you can. You can work with the inner integral, find an antiderivative of this expression with respect to y, sub in the bounds, take their difference, then work on the outer integral. So let's give it a try. We need to find an antiderivative for y sine xy with respect to y. Okay, well, it looks like we have a function of y times another function of y. So maybe integration by parts could be useful here. Remember, integration by parts is sort of like the product rule for derivatives, but working in reverse. It says that if you're integrating a product of two functions, then you can differentiate one of them and anti-differentiate the other and combine those two functions in a way to evaluate your integral. Formally, it says that if you're integrating something of the form u dv, then this integral can be written as uv minus the integral of v du. So u here is the term that's going to get differentiated to du, and dv is going to be the term that gets integrated to v. In this case, I'm going to set u to be this term, y. And I chose that because when you differentiate, that function becomes simpler. That means my dv term is going to be sine xy dy. So let's write this down. If u is y, then du is going to be dy. And if dv is sine xy dy, well, the antiderivative of this expression is going to be minus cos xy over x, right? And you can check this by just differentiating with respect to y. You should get sine xy dy back. All right, so I'm going to leave my outer integral alone. I have the integral from 1 to 2. But for this inner integral, I'm going to use my integration by parts formula. I get uv, that's y times minus cos xy over x, and I'm going to evaluate this expression from 0 to pi, and then I have to subtract the integral of v du. Okay, now v is this expression here, so I'm actually going to add the integral of cos xy over x, and then du is dy. So dy, and then outside all of this, I have dx from my outer integral. Oh, well, it looks pretty bad, but let's sub in these bounds and see what we get. We have the integral from 1 to 2. I'm going to sub in pi for y. That gives me minus pi cos of pi x over x. Uh, and then I should subtract what I get by subbing in 0. But notice that if I sub in 0 for y, I'm going to kill off this entire term. So we won't even bother subbing in 0. But now I'm supposed to take the integral of cos xy over x with respect to y. An antiderivative for this expression with respect to y is sine xy over x squared. So I get sine xy over x squared evaluated from 0 to pi dx. Oh, well, at this point, folks, I'm going to be honest. I'm starting to get a little bit worried. If you sub in these bounds for y, things will clean up a little bit, but the expression will still look pretty darn gross. And we still have to integrate with respect to x. Oh, we've already done so much work. I don't want to have to keep going down this road. So instead, I'm actually going to abandon ship. I'm going to ditch these calculations and instead try solving this problem in a different way. I'm going to solve the integral by switching the order. On the last slide, we ran into so many complications because this inner integral with respect to y required us to use integration by parts. That just made the whole thing look really, really nasty and difficult to work with. So instead, I'm actually going to start this problem by integrating first with respect to x. Remember, if we're integrating over a rectangle, we can switch the order freely. So I'm going to write this as the integral from 0 to pi of the integral from 1 to 2 of y sine xy dx dy. Well, you can see right away we're integrating dx, but we don't have a product of two functions of x. So integration by parts won't be needed. We can simply anti-differentiate sine xy with respect to x to get minus cos xy over y. Putting it all together, we have the integral from 0 to pi 
of y times our antiderivative minus cos xy over y dy. Well, I notice the small miracle that happens here. This y out front cancels with a y in our antiderivative. When we sub in our two bounds, x equals 1 and x equals 2, we get the integral from 0 to pi of minus cos of 2y plus cos y dy. Much simpler, no integration by parts. We anti-differentiate one more time to get minus sine of 2y over 2 plus sine of y evaluated from 0 to pi. Now, I'll let you sub in these bounds yourself, but what you should see is everything disappear. Remember, sine of zero, sine of pi, sine of two pi, they're all zero. So we get a final answer of zero. The moral of this story is it's always important to keep in mind the order of your integration. Sometimes a simple switch of the order, which is always something you can do when integrating over a rectangle, can make your life a whole lot easier. Now before we wrap up this video, some of you may be wondering, Zach, does this answer even make sense? If the double integral is meant to compute the volume under a surface, how is it possible that we're getting a value of zero? This is a fantastic question, and if it crossed your mind, it shows you're thinking very deeply about the material, which is great. Allow me to answer this question by first recalling an important fact about integrals that you may remember from Calc 2. Suppose we have a function of one variable whose graph over an interval a, b lives above the x-axis. The example you can keep in mind is the function y equals x on the interval 0, 1. Back in Calc 2, you learned to interpret the definite integral of this function as the area below the curve and above the x-axis. In our example, the integral on the left would give us a value of 1 half, which is exactly the area of this triangular region shown here. But the situation is a little different if the graph of our function dips below the x-axis. Consider, for example, the function y equals x, but this time over the interval minus 1 to 1. In this case, the definite integral on the left actually evaluates to 0. The reason for this is that the integral counts the area above the x-axis as positive area, but counts the area below the x-axis as negative area. In other words, the integral is computing the difference in area above the x-axis and the area below the x-axis. It's what we might call a signed area. With this in mind, it's certainly possible to encounter integrals that evaluate to zero, like this one, or integrals that evaluate to negative numbers. Let's see how this situation extends to Calc 3. Our interpretation of a double integral in Calc 3 is exactly analogous to our interpretation of a single integral in Calc 2. If the graph of our function lives above a given region r in the xy plane, shown here in gray, then yeah, the double integral over r represents the volume under our surface and above this region in the plane. But if the graph throughout r dips below the xy plane, again shown here in gray, then the volume above the plane will be counted positively, but the volume below the plane will be counted negatively. The double integral is actually computing the difference in these two volumes. It's what we might call a signed volume. The image on the right is actually the graph of the function we considered earlier in our video, f of xy equals y times sine of xy. It just so happens that the volume above the xy plane here is exactly equal to the volume below the xy plane. The two quantities cancel out in the integral, giving us a value of zero.